This talk from Whitley Strieber was delivered in December of 2022 in New York City at an inquiry into anomalous experiences and the phenomenon. We've recently announced the next conference event in this series, which will be happening on Saturday, April 8, 2023, in New York City and online. We'll be joined by Leslie Kane, Ryan Graves, Derek Pitts, James Fox, Elizabeth Crone, Peter Lavenda, and Dr. Daniel Ingram. Hosted by Leslie Kane, James Iandoli, and me, J. Christopher King. Tickets to join us live or online are now available at aninquiry2023.com, but they're going fast. That link is down in the show notes and also in the comments. We're looking forward to the upcoming conference, and we hope to see you there. And now, we bring you Priscilla Stone and Whitley Strieber. I hope everybody's having a wonderful night. It's definitely wonderful to see everybody here together again, and it just makes my heart so full. Tonight, I, I kind of want to give some remarks on the disclosure movement and experiencers. So in the modern disclosure movement, there's a heavy focus on legislation and what is often termed credible witness accounts. Although data and legislation would contribute to the process of proving and understanding the existence of UFOs and their occupants, I can't help but wonder about those who have had a sort of personal disclosure in their life. I'm talking about the vast array of not only experiencers, but also the anomalous events experienced by them. These people whose lives were changed forever by the anomalous. This includes many phenomena from UFOs to spirits to cryptids. These experiences trigger anything from a spiritual awakening to a spiritual condemnation. I can't help but be concerned about the experiencer who is now doubting their reality, their existence, spirituality, and nature of the universe. And too often they're forced to keep quiet. They're gagged by the overbearing presence of stigma and fearful of losing friends, families, careers, and sometimes their homes. All of this is due to an experience that in many cases was not asked for. This is why the education of these topics must continue. They must cover all facets of the anomalous, including but not limited to legislation, data, and experiencer accounts. As for the nature of these anomalous events, I think that it's safe to say that we're in the dark a little bit about this. Um, and as we venture into the darkness unknown, each of us has a torch that's shedding light on truth and offering warmth and understanding to anybody that seeks it. So together, we're no longer just this lone torch, but a blazing beacon, and a blazing beacon that leads others to inquire the anomalous and accept the unknown as part of reality. Our next speaker has been a beacon for many of us, whose sacrifice and dedication to the topic of UFOs and their occupants and the phenomena surrounding it have paved a way for others to follow. This man bravely tore through the stigma and was one of the first to publicly say, this happened to me, I'm not going to sit down, I'm not going to be quiet, and I will speak my truth at all costs. He has written many books and continues the conversation to this day, educating people about the phenomena and the many entities and occupants involved. And if you have not guessed who this is by now, I am honored to welcome Whitley Strieber to the stage. Well, I'm certainly glad to be here. And, you know, I'm going to start a little differently from what I had planned if indeed I had planned anything, I, which I had done, no, no, actually, I got a speech. Uh, in any case, uh, Ralph's wonderful talk got me thinking about John, and I want to tell a John story. I, I knew him fairly well. We had a lot of fun together, mostly. We, we um, cut up a lot, both of us cut up a lot when we were boys, and uh, we had fun telling stories uh, about uh, on on each other or to each other about our our childhoods, but I knew a man uh, who was a friend of Tim Leary's, and when Tim was dying, and I knew Tim but not all that well, and when he was dying, he decided that he would have his head cryogenically frozen, and uh, so m there was a documentary to be made 
and the documentarists were there, everything was going on, and and the question was, the lawyers had been involved. It turned out that you couldn't simply have a head in your refrigerator, a human head anyway. <laughs> and, and so the idea was that Tim's head would be smuggled from person to person to keep it out of the hands of the authorities. And I was called and, and, and was asked, would I hold the head for a year? In a in a cryogenic safe and you know plugged in, make sure it didn't melt. And I said, sure, of course, I, I'd be glad to. I mean, if, how can I go wrong, right? So, <laughs> um, and I called other friends, and uh, one after another, and they all said, absolutely not, no way. Uh, and I thought, well, who is the wildest person I know? And it occurred to me, after listening to his stories about his misspent youth building all kinds of intricate devices which shall go unnamed as a boy and doing various things similar to what I did, which shall go unmentioned, um, I thought I'd call John and see what he said. And he listened to this story and he said, why, of course, I'll be glad to. And that was very cool. He was a wonderful, cool guy. He had he had a willingness to look at things and do things that were just a bit beyond the edge. And as far as Harvard was concerned, way beyond the edge. But as far as us experiences were concerned, just a bit beyond the edge. And he is one of my great heroes. And I just want to thank Ralph for his dedication to the life of John Mack and to his legacy, of which would, has been beautifully preserved and presented to the world by Ralph and his efforts. And so I enjoyed that. In it takes good. <laughs> Typical of Timothy, he had no plans whatsoever to have his head cryogenically frozen. All right. There she is. Now, why look at that face, those big eyes that you know, those eyes, the, the at Rice University, at Je, at, through the efforts of Jeff Kripal, there is a, a an archive called the Archive of, I believe the Archive of the Impossible, is that? Yes. And in it is are the communion letters, thousands of them, that Anne saved. Uh, my wife, Anne, who named our book Communion, and you'll see her, a uh, your friend Timothy Greenfield Saunders, who you'll also see in a video in a few minutes, um, made a video of Anne about 15 years after the communion experience telling how she felt when I sat down with her and told her uh, I thought I'd been abducted by aliens. Well, I'll get into that a little bit more later. Uh, by the way, this is my website. You can follow me there. And some of you are already subscribers to unknowncountry.com, I don't, I believe, and you, you're most welcome to subscribe. But you, there's plenty of free stuff on it if you don't care to subscribe. There's a, it's a community basically, and it's is a, there's a free aspect to it as well as a, a subscription aspect to it. Um, now, what I would like to do is this. It's been a long time since the communion experience happened, and my understanding of what did happen is evolved considerably over the years. This is the cabin where it happened. Uh, we don't own it anymore. I was there a few months ago. Uh, they, uh, the Travel Channel did a documentary about me called The Visitors, which you can now see on Discovery Plus, and I believe it's available for like $2 on YouTube. And uh, so it's, and it's a 90-minute documentary. It's quite good, actually, I think. And this is uh, this is where it happened, uh, on a rather isolated little private road in upstate New York. Uh, not a um, not wasn't out in the middle of nowhere, but it was, you know, quite isolated. And beyond those trees, there's an, the road, and then a couple of other houses, and then beyond that, an enormous uh, wilderness that is uh, owned by the state of New York. It's state land, and they will never release it. So 
it's it it has and then in, toward us and then the other direction is uh is the little a little town and i took this picture from not too far from where the abduction happened and it started though here in this bedroom in that bed actually i was sleeping on the on the uh right side of it and that night and annie was on the on the inside bed of the bed and she didn't remember a thing the next morning i was um the next morning i was distraught for no re- apparent reason i was uh, i i couldn't think what had happened to me I thought perhaps I had seen an owl in the house. And I explained to Anne, this to Anne, and she finally said, look, Whitley, there was no owl in the house. And I thought, I'm being a f- making a fool of myself. I'm, I, I, obviously, there was no owl in the house. So I said, well, yeah, obviously not. But when the sun went down, I was in this bedroom again, looking out that window, and the, it was snowy, and the sun was dropping, and I thought, there was no owl in the house, so what happened? And I was just mystified. This was something that came out of nowhere to me. I, the idea of alien abduction was not in my, my reality. I didn't know what it was. I'd never heard of such a thing. And um, friends tell me that in those days, if people brought up flying saucers and stuff like that. I was rather hostile about it. You know, I, I'd been writing horror novels and things though but because but to me it was sort of a very novelistic idea it was story time basically i did not remember anything that had happened to me as a child and in fact still to this day i'm very unsure about that although apparently things did so in any case i began to have flashes of very odd memories and i kept remembering these figures now, uh, this is from the movie Communion, but they're very, they're quite accurate. I, I, I remembered this, these men uh, looking at me and moving around very quickly, and I thought to myself, what in the world is going on? And then I began to suffer pain. Uh, I, I wrote a short story called Pain, in fact, during this period. I was in pain. I had a pain in the side of my head and pain in my rectum significantly enough to where I went to the doctor. <laughs> and I, by that time, I had sort of come, I had the, a, a, a series of very strange memories. It still hadn't occurred to me that they could be anything real. So I described the memories to the doctor, and he uh, he said, well, you t- you tell- you're telling me you were taken aboard a flying saucer by little men. He was the first person who actually said those words. And I thought, my God, that is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. I said, well, that does is what it sounds like. And he said, well, uh, after gently telling me I had been raped, which had happened, uh, uh, he he said, we need to do a thorough workup physically and mentally. And his thinking was that I had been assaulted and I was in a state of, from, uh, I was very traumatized. And I thought I was going crazy because of these memories. I thought I had a brain tumor. So we did an MRI scan. Uh, brain was normal. Uh, did a, uh, a physical workup and I had been injured pretty badly. In fact, that injury, the scar from it, uh, I suffered from that scar for another 20, 25 years off and on and had to spend time quite often with uh, specialists who who would treat the pain basically back there and also had to spend time uh, watching television and, and listening to the radio about rectal probe jokes. I had the experience of having my rape become an international joke. Uh, that's something that's hard to deal with. Uh, and we're getting a little bit more sensitive now, at least to women, but it's, as far as I can tell, when a man's raped, it's still hilarious. 
it actually isn't very funny at all. So this is me in that era. You can see the face. It's a, it's a traumatized person, basically. At least that's how I see my expression. And I was trying to figure out something that made sense because I couldn't believe that this, this idiot, idiotic idea of, the, of aliens was real. I had not at that point been exposed to any literature of, 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 at all of this. I didn't even know at that point that there was any. I thought maybe I had been attacked because of a book called War Day. Uh, War Day was a, uh, a book about the dangers of limited nuclear war, published at a time when the Reagan administration was keenly interested in hardening our industrial sites against the uh, uh, n- a limited nuclear attack. And I found that very concerning for two reasons. The first one was, if they did that and budget, built a big th- budget through FEMA for it, which was the plan at the time, was going to tell the Russians that n- maybe mutually assured destruction wasn't actually such a good idea, and they may not be able to win a nuclear war they didn't start first. So I thought it was very destabilizing, and I also was concerned about nothing in the budget for, like, our houses. What about, you know, yeah, you could save the factory, but if all the workers are dead, what, what's the point? So I decided to write War Day with my dear friend Jim Koneka, a science writer, uh, and to make it a kind of a tour across the country after a limited nuclear war to see what that was like. And the book was a, quite influential. It was a bestseller. Uh, parts of it were read on the floor of the United States Senate and put into the congressional record. And I thought, well, maybe it made somebody who was in favor of that program mad enough to have me assaulted in some weird way because I just couldn't figure out any other explanation. And um, I, I was absolutely at a loss. At the same time, though, I thought in the back of my mind that I had had a psychotic break and I had this beautiful wife and a little boy, and if she ended up married to a man who was in a mental institution, she would not be able to divorce me. She would have been left penniless with this albatross around her neck. So I began to try to get her to divorce me, and we kept having fights. We had fight after fight after fight, and this is what our marriage looked like. This is how it felt. That picture is very much how it felt. And I was trying to break that up so that she would be saved from having to deal with a mental case. Then at at Christmas, my brother had sent me his usual unfortunate gift. Uh, We, 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 uh, my brother and I are great friends and we're, and we always send each other things that we think the other person will think is absolutely ridiculous. And his gift this year had been something called Science and the UFOs, which actually he took quite seriously, but I didn't know that at the time. I thought it was another joke gift. But I, I opened it, and I started reading it, just basically to get my mind off of, ironically enough, off of the weirdness that was happening to me. I thought, well, this is weird. It's weird, but in a different way from my weirdness. I was, I was assaulted by some kind of a criminal, and, or criminals, and this is nothing about criminals. Then I got to the latter part of it, and there, to my horror and astonishment, was a story about a UFO abduction. It was the first time I'd ever heard of such a thing. And it was it mentioned a man named Bud Hopkins. And Bud, uh, as it turned out, Oh, the slides are a little out of order, but that doesn't matter. But uh, it turned out lived quite near us in Manhattan. And I said to Anne, I'd look at this. And she said, well, this looks like what happened to you. I said, I know it does. And she said, but of course you understand it did not happen to you or anybody else. I said, well, I still want to talk to this guy. And she said, well, okay, well, we'll go talk to him. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go with you, though, because I don't want you to get overly enthusiastic about whatever this is. And because she, she, she felt like 
you know, I was, I was already, we were fighting and we were, I was trying to get rid of her, get her to leave me. And, uh, it was a very hard time. And, uh, she did not trust my judgment enough to send me off to meet a UFO abduction person by myself. So off I went, we went to meet Bud Hopkins. And we, uh, we met this a lovely man. This is, this is uh, Don Klein, who in, he introduced us to. And, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I'm just, Bud should have been in this slide, but he's not. And I, I don't dare try to reverse them because then we'll end up with no slides at all. In any case, Don was the head of the New York State Department of Psychiatry at the time and had 72 documented cases where he had solved crimes using forensic hypnosis. So never let anyone tell you that forensic hypnosis in the hands of a professional doesn't work because it does. And I trusted Don Klein, and, and to his credit, Bud, who, is, who, who was a hypnotist himself, had wanted to hypnotize me, but I said, absolutely not, because you're, I mean, I see you as an artist, a very good artist, he was, he was a fabulous artist, but I don't see you as somehow anything to do whatsoever with psychology or psychiatry, and you don't have a license of any kind, so no. And that was, he proceeded to get me the best person probably in the, in the United States and maybe the world, Don Klein. Now, after being hypnotized by Don Klein, I had, there were two sessions, and you'll see them if you, if you watch that the Discovery Channel documentary, if you watch The Visitors. And the first session was appalling. It covered a time in October before the big experience that occurred in December of 1985 that was the genesis of communion. It was a something that happened when two dear friends, in fact, a mutual friend uh, is here today, uh, of the two of them and of me, uh, Annie Gottlieb and Jacques Sandulescu were at our country house at the cabin, and in the middle of the night, in, this was in October, a huge light just shone over the whole place and turned it into, like, daylight at 3 o'clock in the morning. And I, I, it woke me right up. There was a loud bang. My little boy, whose bedroom was downstairs, started crying. Uh, I, I ran down the stairs. I thought the house was had burst into flames. And then the light just went out, and I ended up at the foot of the stairs in the dark. And so I thought, well, I don't know what that was. Maybe it was lightning. And so I passed Jock and Annie's room, and Annie was just coming out of the room. And I said, it's okay. It was nothing. And then I went and comforted my little boy and went back to bed. And so Don wanted to go back to that night. Annie Gottlieb had remembered hearing footsteps of some sort go running across our bedroom floor from upstairs uh, when uh, just before I came down, scurrying, as she put it. Uh, she and Jock were asked to to recount their experiences, but were, uh, to talk about that night, but were told nothing whatsoever at all about what I remembered or Anne remembered, nothing. So when they talked about it, they were completely just remembering their own experiences. Jacques had experienced the light as being so bright he thought he'd overslept, and it was 10 o'clock in the morning at least, and then it suddenly went out. Annie had heard the scurrying footsteps and thought it was our cats, only our cats weren't there. Our cats were in New York at the time. When Don hypnotized me, that was the first time I ever came to the idea that there was some unusual sort of being involved in this. And it was one of the most, probably the most terrifying moment of my life was that moment when I realized I was seeing something that wasn't human standing across the bedroom at the, at, uh, on the far side of our bedroom like the dark blue figures I showed you a little while ago. So that was the beginning of it. Now I had all of this in my head, and uh, I had to figure out, what do I do here? I've been trying to get Anne to divorce me, but if I tell her this story, she is going to want a divorce, and I don't want a divorce at all. I never did. 
So I had a dear friend, a photographer, uh, he's also a documentary filmmaker, he's very well known, called Timothy Greenfield Saunders. And Timothy were, and I were close friends. And so I went to Timothy, and I thought, I'll tell Tim, because he's, 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 he knows I'm completely crazy, so he, he, won't, he, won't, he won't bat an eye. And so I told him, and this is the, I hope it's going to be the video. And he seemed a little disturbed, and I said, you know, but they, what's going on? He goes, well, I don't know how to say this, but, you know, and I said, well, what, what? And he said, he finally kind of got it out and said, I was abducted by aliens. I was the first person he had ever told about the abduction. I could tell from the way he was speaking to me that this was very real to him. Uh, I, I mean, I thought he could have had a psychotic break or something. I didn't know, but it was not put on. No. And I said, I'm trying to figure out how I tell him this. He said, Whitley, I have no idea what happened, but I think that you just tell her what you remember. That's all you can do. And she was very nervous because she thought I was going to say it's over. The marriage is over. And so I said, I have a story to tell you. And he said to me, I think I've been abducted by aliens. And I said to him, oh, thank God, you don't have to get a divorce. <laughs> <laughs> that was Annie. And I'd like to talk a little bit about this extraordinary woman. Um, as soon as she knew the story, she took over. It was as if she was made for this. Of all things, a gal from with uh, with a good education, she was from uh, Michigan. She'd gone to the University of Michigan and then uh, uh, finished her degree in English literature at NYU and then and had an MA in teaching from Bank Street College of Education. So she was a very well-educated person and a teacher to her core, and thank God, because she helped me tremendously in this. She was the one who set out to make sure that the book didn't close doors that it was not a book of beliefs or assertions, but rather a journey in question, exploring the unknown. Annie used to always say, the human species is too young to have beliefs. What we need are good questions. That is the wisest, one of the wisest things I know, and I live by it to this day. Uh, she was... Uh, um, we are okay. Uh, she was a an absolute master intellectually. She was the most brilliant person I ever knew in my life. If it hadn't been for Annie saying, um, when the letters started to pour in, and I mean the post office was bringing them in bags. Three or four postmen would bring bags of mail and dump them on our the floor of our living room. And I was just flabbergasted. I didn't know what to do because no one had expected that there were that many people who had had this experience. And, it, it, and you'd think, oh, well, they were all just repeating what he said in his book. No, no, no. This is without question the most complex human experience that has ever been recorded in the world. And it has been recorded by the people who had it. And those letters were saved by Ann Streber and are now at Rice. And thank God, uh, because they are an enormously valuable resource. And Rice, and thanks to Jeff and others, is, they're going to be digitized and become accessible to scholarly research. And, and we're going to be able to do an awful lot of exciting stuff with them. Yeah. Thank you. Now... We were going at the time to see Bud, and Bud was, had his ideas, and he was very convinced of them. And I love Bud, but we had fights, but, uh, Bud and I. But, I, you know, I, 
on balance, think he, he did an extraordinary thing and had an enormous amount of courage to walk out of a brilliant career in, in art as an artist in, in New York and marginalize himself by becoming a UFO investigator. Uh, that took guts, and he did it anyway. And that, that's the characteristic of all of these people. <laughs> uh, they, they do it anyway because it's something important and they know it. And they know it's lied about. So anyway, but happened to mention a book called Passport to Magonia by Jacques Vallée and said that this is exactly the sort of thing that we don't need. So we left the house that day and Anne says, we're going down to the Strand Bookstore to look for Passport to Magonia. <laughs> and so we got Passport to Magonia. She read it. She could read a Oh, she could read a, a novel in, in four hours and a book like that. She took a little bit longer. She read it. It took it about a day. And she said to me, Whitley, you've got to read this. And I, and I read it. And it, it's a remarkable story because it deepens this mystery in very extraordinary ways. It goes all the way back a thousand, more than a thousand years, telling stories, of, drawing stories from the past about the actions of this presence. This presence. I call them the visitors, and that's not the wrong thing to call them because they never stay anywhere very long. At the same time, they've apparently been here for quite a long time. Are they something to do with us? Are we part of them? Are they part of us? Those are unanswered questions at the present time. We we live in a shorthand of assumptions about alien versus human, but I'm not so sure that's the right place to be with this. And this book suggests, definitely suggests otherwise. So that was very exciting to us. And it was the beginning of our rift with Bud, because Bud did not think this was in any way worth, uh, worth pursuing. Uh, I, I'll tell you, one of the wonderful stories from the book is what happened when uh, a, a, what would we now would call a UFO fleet arrived over medieval Japan in the 15th century. <laughs> and the emperor demanded, I want to know what this is of his astronomers, or probably astrologers actually in those days. And they put their heads together, knowing their heads would come off if they didn't come up with a good answer very quickly, and said, Sire, it's just the wind making the stars sway. How poetic was the first effort at debunking. <laughs> so, uh, uh, in any case, the next thing that happened to me was very shocking indeed. It happened in May of 1989. I was lying in bed reading. Anne was asleep. It was May evening. The windows were open in the bedroom. In the, in, we were in the country house. It was dark. And we had a gravel driveway on one side and a deck and pool on the other. And... There was crunching sound in the driveway. It was a big gate that you couldn't get into the, 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 the place, and the gate was closed and locked. That crunching meant a car in the driveway. Very upsetting for three reasons. One is they got around the closed gate, and it was a stout gate. Two is they had no lights. And three is they were there. So I knew we were in trouble. Now, being a Texan, I was gunned up, of course. <laughs> I had a, a Benelli riot gun under the bed, and I had a uh, pistol in the drawer beside the bed. Beside the bed also were a bank of switches which you could turn on, and lights would turn on all around the house. Uh, floodlights. In fact, the floodlights are still there. The people who own the cabin now use them all the time. So... Not, not for this purpose, but you know, just to make it easier to have fun in, at night around the cabin. They don't have, they haven't had any experiences that I know of, although they do have a lovely Whitley Streamer room in the basement, which has got all kinds of <clears throat> memorabilia in it. In any case, uh, 
<coughs> they're, excuse me, they're very sweet people, and if you watch the documentary, you'll meet them. Uh, we were, um, I was hearing this, and I was realizing, you know, someone, someone's here, and it's not good because it's 11 o'clock at night and they don't have their lights on and et cetera, all of those things. So I started to go for the lights. But then as I moved, I saw that a man and a woman were standing at the foot of the bed. And I thought, forget the lights, go for the gun. And the next thing I knew, I was lying on my, uh, yeah, my left side facing in. I could not move. I could not see and there was someone pushing against my head, pushing my head down into the pillow in waves, and the woman's voice was speaking very gently and softly. Uh, just before this happened, as I woke up and came to, I was not asleep, I was awake, but as I came to awareness of this happening, a voice, a male voice in the backyard had said, condition red, very quiet. And uh, uh, then... I blacked out for a couple of seconds. Then suddenly I was free. I leaped up out of the bed, saw that the alarm system was still armed, grabbed the pistol, turned on all the lights, heard a crashing noise out in the woods behind the house, ran through the house to every entry point that was armed, uh, alarmed. Nothing was, was disturbed. Ended up coming, sitting set on the side of the bed, knowing that the alarm system had not been disturbed. So I had, by that time, read up a lot about lucid dreams and uh, all kinds of stuff you can imagine. I mean, I was really researching this very deeply. The community had already been written, and I was in uh, plenty of trouble. I'd, we'd lost a lot of our literary friends. Uh, it was, you know, so I was very aware of all of this at the time. And... I thought, it must have been some kind of a bizarre dream. I can't explain it any other way. So I sort of went to sleep. I mean, sleep in quotes. Just lay like this. <laughs> no, kind of. Um, and uh, the next morning, I got up to go get the paper. And where we lived, you had to drive out to get the paper. I am, to this day, an inveterate reader of the paper. So... I was going to go get the paper. I opened the door into the garage. The alarm system was still armed. There's a pad in the garage. But have the door. The garage door was wide open, even though the alarm system was still armed. So I disarmed the alarm system and got in the car, still planning to get the paper, and the car was so filled with static electricity, I jumped out. I thought it was going to blow up. And I called the alarm man and said something's wrong with the alarm system. The garage door was wide open and it was still armed. So he comes over and uh, he says, uh, there's a very powerful magnetic field between the two switches in the garage. And we don't have that. That's not in our, we do, our switches aren't that powerful and yet the magnetic field is there. So he changed out the switches and left. This is all he could do. But I knew something weird had happened at that point, obviously. I don't recall if I ever did get the paper that day. Then in the next couple of days, my ear began to hurt this year. And, and there's a little bump in it. Now, I this, this time I knew Roger Lear. I knew Dr. Roger Lear, who had done a lot of research into implants. I knew all about implants. And at least what we knew then, I knew. So I thought to myself, I said to Annie, I think they put an implant in me. I think that was what that was all about. She felt it and said, yeah, maybe so. And feels, and so I think, I said, I want to get it out. And she said, well, why do you want to get it out? Why don't you try to figure out what it's there for? I said, I don't want to figure out what it's there for. I don't want to be tracked. And she said, Whitley, nobody cares whether or not you go down to the 7-Eleven. Nobody from outer space anyway. And I had to admit that was true. So I had lived with it for a couple of years. Then we, we lost the cabin. Uh, we had a the rectal probe jokes were having their effect on my my sales. People will buy a book from someone who's controversial, but they're not going to buy a book from about somebody who's a laughing stock. And in those days, you bought a book from a bookseller, and you, you're not going to walk up to a bookseller and buy a book 
and watch the bookseller snickering at you because you've got a Whitley Strieber book in your hand. So my sales collapsed. And uh, after South Park, I believe it was, came out with the first, their first episode, which was a huge hit and was basically about me. And uh, they, uh, they wrecked my life, actually. So we'd lost the cabin anyway. And we were going down. We had a little condo in Texas and we were going to go down there and live. And you know, otherwise, we would have been homeless. So um, uh, when we were there, I got into. Uh, uh, I became friends with a with a lady who said that she knew a doctor who might might be willing to try to get it out. And I said, "No, doctor, you don't tell him what it is." He says, "No, no, no. Let's just let him look at it." And Annie was saying, "No, Whitley, don't do it. Don't do it." And I said, "Look, it had turned on every once in a while." And it would turn on, my ear would turn bright red and feel very hot, and I would hear this whining noise. And it was really s- disturbing. And it happened, incidentally, at the at Southwest Research Institute in Texas, which had been founded by a Tom Slick, a family friend, years and years before. Mr. Slick sadly died in an airplane accident, in any case. Uh, it, but I had an in there because I, his kids were friends of mine, his niece especially. And um, so I had had implants being researched there by the head of their material science division, Dr. William Mallow. And I was out there once with Bill talking about my implant. And it turned bright red in his office. And he said, my God, Whitley, your ear's turning red. I said, it's turned on, Bill. It's turned on right now. He said, let's go into signals acquisition. We ran across the campus and went into a signals acquisition lab and they said, after a while, we've got a signal, but we can't tell you anything about it because the lab's classified. The lab's classified. So I, I thought to myself, this is sort of annoying, but typical. In any case, uh, 20-some years later, I was doing a book signing in San Antonio, and a couple of guys walked up out of the crowd and said, we're... We were in the lab. We just want you to know it's one of the strangest signals that's ever been recorded. It's still under study, and they walked away. Whether they were just fooling me or that was a real thing, I don't know. In any case, uh, I wanted to get the implant out, and this next slide is a little bit more about the implant. It bothers me sometimes. My ear turns red and gets hot, and it creeps me out. I find a doctor who's willing to take a look at it, not as an implant. I didn't tell him that. And he see, feels it, and he says, well, it feels like a little cyst. I'm sure I can pull that out. I'm glad he's Yeah. He deadens the ear and opens it up. And he touches it with his scalpel and goes down into my earlobe on its own, moves on its own. It's like it's just grinding its bed. Oh, it's like a little tiny bite, like yes. So he sort of. Pulls back. He knows I wrote Communion, and now he's made the connection. I'm trying to take an alien implant out of this guy, and I'm, I'm done here. At some point, the doctor says, I don't think I could get this out without mangling your ear. And so they stop the procedure at that point, and Whitley comes home. And it's Anne who suggests, hey, Whitley, maybe you want to leave this in. What if this is some way to communicate back and forth? What if this is now opening a, a two-way communication with these beings, whereas before they had to come to you, now maybe you can call to them. So that's the implant, and I I like to show this video because uh, it's real. I'm talking about something that's physically real that has a lot to do with things we consider unreal. And, but that is uh, not the case. Let's see where we are here. 
Uh, okay. This is a, 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 a CAT scan taken recently, and you can see it in the, in the earlobe, but the strange thing about this is some of the doctors who have seen this say that looks to them like a, like a marker put in by the radiologist, a, a, a place marker. But the problem is nobody put anything in it. I was there. I, I, it was my year. I was actually there when this happened, and no one did anything except it, they took the uh, scan. So uh, I was left, I'm, you know, as far as I'm concerned, I think that is the implant. So um, it's still there. And I've gone from not wanting it there to it being the most valuable tool I have. I... It is a marvelous research tool. After Annie passed away, and this is getting going to get into some high strangeness here, but that's okay. That's what you're here for, I presume. Um, <laughs> um, so, in any, any case, after Annie passed away, a slit opened up in my right eye. And uh, if I looked against a white wall, I'd, I would notice... I noticed the first notice him because I would see I would be talking to somebody in a bright sunny day and I'd see mo movement in my eye that shouldn't have been there. I thought, "Oh, you're going blind." But and I looked at a at a at it against a white wall and I could see words like typed words going past in this neat oblong slit, moving too fast to, for me to read, but they were clearly English words. And I thought, "What the heck is this?" But then I began to realize that there was something going on because I began to be be able to uh, to uh, uh, to do research very effectively, and I, I was so excited by this I decided to to test it by doing something that was essentially impossible, and I wrote a historical novel called In Hitler's House, which is a novel it's a spy novel about a young it's a it's a a faux memoir by a man it's written in writing in the 1970s about his experience being intimately part of Hitler's personal entourage back during the war as a german american boy who was at first sort of seduced by hitler and then when he realized how dangerous hitler was became a spy for the allies in hitler's immediate personal entourage. Now, to write something like that, you have to make, it has to read as if it was written by somebody who was there. And the, the, in other words, the, it has to have a casual relationship with everyday life in Germany in the 1930s and 40s. Could I do, could the implant help me? That was my question. And that's when I started and it, it worked wonderfully well. But no one would publish the book for two reasons. One, Whitley Strieber does not get books published anymore. Two, um, uh, it was too long. It was very long. It's a thousand pages. But you can get it on the Internet. It's called In Hitler's House. It's on Amazon. Um, so I learned doing that to use it as a research tool. And then I used it as a very deep research tool in another book called Jesus and New Vision, which is a completely... New vision of Jesus. It has nothing to do with aliens. I do not think Jesus was an alien. Okay, no, you get past that immediately. But it's a, it, it, it's a very efficient, effective tool. I've used it in a new world. I use it now. I'm, I've just finished a, a new book I'll talk about in a few minutes called Them, which is about the visitors. Uh, I used it in Them uh, to analyze letters from the communion archives. And it is a wonderful tool. Does it do other things that I don't like? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, this, uh, the question of why this would be like this with some people and not others, first of all, I have to say that obviously there's nothing, that people with perfectly ordinary brains have close encounter experiences, plenty of them. So that's not, this, what I'm going to talk about, is not a mean that you have to have a special kind of brain. But I think you do perhaps have a special kind of brain to have the kind of life I've had and that some others have had too. Uh, Dr. Gary Nolan, I think you're 
probably mostly familiar with Dr. Gary. With Gary, uh, he is a uh, a PhD PhD scientist. He has a big lab at uh, at Stanford. He's a very very prominent inventor and uh, and uh, created many companies. And he's his work in medical technology is absolutely brilliant. And he took an interest in this uh, for various reasons and discovered that there were certain people with uh, a very dense white matter between two parts of the brain called the caudate and the putamen, which is part of the executive area of the brain which organizes perceptions, and uh, that people with this super dense white matter uh, were very good remote viewers, psychics, and often had close encounter experiences, et cetera, and so forth. So I sent them an MRI scan from my brain from 2014, and it turned out that my the white matter in my brain was high normal, but the structure of it between the two is completely unique in the mind in the experience of the neurosurgeon who looked at it and he said it is non-pathological and and completely unique. So that might be the reason that all this weird stuff happens to me. I just, I don't know. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I should have changed slides. Okay. So now we get down to, to her again, or it, or him. I thought it was a her, but then again, if you read the Close Encounter literature, you find that Everyone seems to think that the aliens that they're with are the opposite sex from them. So who knows what's going on there? This face had a triggering effect. I alluded to it briefly at the beginning of the lecture, but those eyes did something to people. They, they didn't even need to read the book. The second they saw the eyes, their memories returned, which is absolutely fascinating to me. And that was why we got all of this incredible wealth of contact experiences, most of which are utterly unique. And does that mean they're all sort of hallucinatory? Each one individually is just nothing but an irrelevant anecdote? does not mean that. It means that people have some kind of an experience that is very complex, very richly varied, and quite often difficult and dangerous, as my experiences were, but as often as not, not that. It can also be very illuminating, leaving people in a state of curiosity more than anything. So, uh, Anne collected 115 of the, le of the letters in this book, the communion letters, and she collected them from the basically trying to each letter is, is represents a whole lot of letters with similar material in them uh, for the most part. But what they're telling us is that there is something going on in our world that we really don't understand and that is new. Because if it wasn't new, the, the, the folkloric output of the past would be more similar to the descriptions in these letters of these of these experiences, and it is not. Passport to Magonia suggests that something has been here for a long time, kind of touching us a little bit here and there, touching us a little bit, but not much. And now it's different. Since World War II, it is not touching us. It is reaching out, for better or for worse, to us. It's reaching out now. It's very different from what happened in the past. Why would that be? Well, if you look in the, in, the, in, the, in the voice of the experiencers, and many of you are experiencers here, and if you look into our voice, you hear that again and again we have been told our planet's in terrible peril. We're in danger. And the summer of 2023 could be one of the worst things to happen. There's parts of the United States that are going to, run out of power in the West in July of 2023 if there's not rain before then, a lot of rain, and that ain't going to happen. So that's going to occur. How will we deal with this? And what about the, the, the fact that we have gotten just to the edge of survivability 
in temperature in large parts of the world, a huge strip of the world from India all the way down through the Middle East. What happens when we go above that as we could in very easily any summer from now? Which summer will be the summer of fire? Because it's coming. So they're right. In fact, uh, I, I wrote a book before I knew they were even in my life called Nature's End. And it's a fairly hokey sort of science fiction story, but it contains incredibly, incredibly frighteningly accurate descriptions of fires uh, all up and down the West Coast, which are now happening. Uh, the, in the book, the Amazon is burning, and that's happening. In the book, the Midwest is turning into a desert. And I flew over the Mississippi a couple of months ago, and you look down on that, and you think, my God, what is going on? Because it's drying up. The Mississippi River is drying up. So they were right about that, and they spread that warning all through the close encounter community, but it wasn't heeded because we're just a bunch of nuts. We don't count. Our warnings don't matter. So why did they do it that way? Why not just go to some to the panjandrums, the, the, the people who run the country and run the world, and talk to them? But that's not what happened. Another thing that happened was that they were, became involved with nuclear missile sites. Uh, from the beginning, back in 1947, they began to interrupt uh, uh, activities with v- V2 rockets in, at White Sands, uh, but I think because of the fact that, that was, we were, the, at that time, also the only people who could put a nuclear weapon aboard a rocket. Uh, we hadn't done it yet. We hadn't gotten that far, but we were, we, we were going in that direction. Um, and then again in 1966 and possibly in 1967, they affected the targeting of uh, American nuclear weapons. They did that in Russia as well. And what does that tell you? In their own way, they are warning us about the danger of nuclear weapons and the danger of, of, of climate change. So what does that say about what they want here? One thing they do want, they want us to survive. Does that mean, oh, they're the good guys? No, they may have their own reasons for wanting us to survive. If we had a herd of cattle, we wouldn't want it to get sick. We'd want it to survive. So be very careful with this. You can never land here. We have to be like little flies flying around looking at what's below us. Never land on any idea. Never forget any. The human species is too young to have beliefs. What we need are good questions. Let's keep all of this in a good, good question and make that question better and better over the years. That gets me to them. This is my book that I just finished. I had uh, about us, oh, let's see, in early October, I guess, I, I was having difficulties in my apartment, which I'll go into in the book. Um, and um, I, I left this country completely because and I went to the UK and holed up in a little flat in a little town in 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 Sussex and just wrote and I didn't have anything on my plate and I only knew I only have one fa- one family there who are friends and they're dear friends and they're very warm people and I felt safe there I do not feel safe in Santa Monica anymore where I, where I live. I'm, I don't know what to do about it. I've got to go back there on Wednesday, and I dread it, I have to tell you. So, because I have been menaced there. And But let me now read a little bit from them, if I can. Now, this will defeat me. I'm not good with machinery, electronics, and they don't like me because they know I don't like them. Uh, We are not friends. I have, and a a, a lot of you, I'm sure, will laugh when you hear this because you also have uh, any experiencers end up with uh, all kinds of uh, uh, bizarre electronic effects. Recently, about a year ago, my computer, my big, I have a big computer that I work on in my office, and it went crazy. 
And I thought, holy God, it's, uh, it, it's, uh, it's, I've got, I was in the middle of something very important. And then it just went dark and so, and wouldn't turn back on. So I thought, I've got to take this in because I've got to get my work done. So I lug it into the car. I turn the car on and the car, which is, it's a Prius, a pretty stable vehicle. Uh, all of its electronics go completely insane. The speedometer, the digital speedometer, is racing up and down between zero and the top, top, bottom. The clock's flashing on and off and changing times. The whole thing, the radio turned on and started blaring away. So I turned off the car and jumped out of it and thought, I'm doomed, <laughs> just doomed. But it settled down, but then it wouldn't start. So I called AAA. They came out. The guy starts the car, and I say, well, what was wrong with it? And he says, well, sir, nothing was wrong with it. It's fine. And I drove off and took the computer in. The man turned it on in the computer store and, and said, well, what, 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 what was wrong with it? I said, well, it, it, it quit and it wouldn't start. He said, well, it's fine. So I took the perfectly fine computer back in the perfectly fine comp- car and said, you bastards, you bastards, and lugged the darn thing back upstairs and finished my work. Okay, here we go. You know, this is both fun and not fun. You have to make it, it, it life in Close Encounter an adventure, or it really is not fun. And, you know, I'm iffy. I mean, I can, the horrible things have happened to me just recently. That's why I left this country, and I, I don't want to be too coy about it. I talk about them in them, but suffice to say, there is someone who could come into my apartment that I can't control, and they began to do things that were absolutely terrifying. They came in one morning, and I, I came back from, I swim a lot in the mornings, or very early. I don't sleep, I'm not a big sleeper, so I get up early and swim. And I came back from swimming, opened the door, and went in, and all of the drawers in my bedroom, the drawers were all opened. And, you know, there was nothing taken. I couldn't find anything taken. So I I thought maybe I should call the cops. And I, a, a cop came over and he said, you know how long it would take me, and I'm not a burglar, to open that lock you've got on that door? It's a, just a key lock in the handle. Uh, I had a heavier lock, but I never used it. He said it would take me five. He said me, you know, he said it would take me about ninety seconds. But somebody who knows what they're doing could open this in five seconds. So that's what happened. Somebody came in, but you know, I had no. There was nothing broken. There was nothing taken that I could find. So he left. There was no po- point in making a police report. So then the next Saturday, I was in a park with one of my grandchildren, just lovely quiet Saturday morning, enjoying watching the kids play. I love kids so much. I'm a big fan of the kid, all kids, even kids who have all kinds of things going on in their lives, the 14 and 15-year-olds. Um, my grand, my older grandson says, Gaia, you don't want to know about my life. I said, well, sure I do. You can't, you can't, you can't top me. I had, I was a hell of a cut up, believe me. Uh, and, um, um, I, I was such a devil in school boy. John Mack was too, by the way. We used to have loads of fun trading stories about our wild childhoods. In any case, um, I wish I'd known him better. God, today I got that call about him. I thought, my God, we've lost too much this time. The experiencer community has lost too much this time. So I don't think it was anything unusual about his death. I think it's exactly as Ralph described. He was not, it was nothing conspiratorial about it. Anyway, uh, the, the, what happened was this. I had a, um, on that Saturday morning, something came into my head saying, you've got to look at the back end of the website right now. And I thought, what? Why am I thinking this? I don't want to look at my website right now. I'm not working. But I did. I opened up. I I had just my phone with me. So I went into the back end of the website on my phone. And at that moment, someone else was 
in the website with an admin username, and they didn't belong there. And they were, they, and I, you can, if you, if you, the site's very secure, and I can watch what people are doing on it, and this person was trying one password after another to break into the site. And I could see the passwords come in one after another, and I realized that this person has a password generator, and they're generating random passwords to try to break in. So I called the um, the uh, webmaster. I said, there's someone trying to hack the site right now. And we ended up for the next hour on a on a chase around the world with, from one IP address to another. And every time he went to, from one to the next, we would close it off. And and finally they stopped so i went rushing back to my 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 um, to my house to l- look at my laptop or i was at a friend's house actually but the la- laptop was there and see if there was any damage to the site that we hadn't detected yet the second i went in with my laptop they were back and this time they were using the admin username and password that my webmaster had given me from the back end Moments, be- five minutes before, it, they had a key logger on my, on my, my uh, computer, my laptop. The key logger had been put in when that break-in occurred, and the drawers were open to deflect me and make me not think about the computer. And we, they destroyed about half the bookstore before we got them out. And we've, okay, I I got a. Stop now. Uh, so, in any case, with all of this crap going on, I felt real vulnerable, and I just got the hell out of there. Uh, I and I'll. There's more about that in them, but let me, let me just quickly read a couple of paragraphs from the book, because I think I've had some valuable insights into who these people are and how they function, and how we can make this work. Because my life would be, my life would be useless. If I was not here trying to make this work, I want it to work for us. I want us to survive. I do not want this planet to kill my grandchildren. I do not want nuclear weapons to kill you. I love you deeply, deeply. I'll do anything for us. I gave myself away to this for us. Okay. As we, let's see. Oh, okay. Let me, let me get to this. Uh, I can't get away from the idea that they are alone. Not a great mass of individuals wandering the night together, but something far more dreadful to be. Many bodies with many individualities but linked by their minds in such a way that they only add up to one single person. Immense experience, immense knowledge, immense power, but entirely alone. Each of us is separate and is immersed in a whole society of other separate beings, all constantly reflecting one another. Because we are individuals, we are never alone. They are individuals too, but because they are all part of just the single mind, they are always alone. To go farther together, we need to learn how to share our two journeys. They can only come to know themselves if they have somebody to reflect their presence in the world. We can only expand beyond Earth and survive if we can journey to the stars. If I am right, then our two journeys have something in common. We are both traveling into our separate vision versions of the unknown, and if so, then realizing this is our main chance, both ours and theirs. A great Hindu wisdom keeper, Sri Nagrata Maharaji, sounded the note upon which such a relationship must rest. The seeker is he who is in search of himself. Give up all questions except one. Who am I? After all, the only fact that you are sure of is that you are. That I am is certain. The I am this is not. Struggle to find out who you are in reality. 
As we probe into the universe, its physics will continue to disclose new knowledge to us. Similarly, as they probe into the boundless labyrinth of our souls, they will also make new discoveries about themselves. If we are calm in our hearts with one another and open each to the other's quests, we will be able to share our discoveries. If I am right, then they are here seeking their own reflection in our community of individuals. For our part, we see our reflections constantly in that same community. For example, each of us can, on their own, in the privacy of their own being, see the wisdom and with it the challenge in Sri, uh, in Sri Nag- Nagata. I'm, I'm going to who can say his name? <laughs> Nisargadatta's words. They can see it too, but in a very different way. If, we, if all of them feed into a collective mind, while they will undoubtedly see the question very well, they will see it only once. They will be and can be, there will be and can be nobody to reflect it back to themselves. No wonder they are searching the universe. They must experience life as a vast confinement. Our coming together will, would free them from a terrible isolation. And in my deepest soul, I think this is what they seek. They're just terribly difficult to deal with. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.